Good morning. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I want to welcome you to Covenant Presbyterian Church. We are here to worship our King. My name is Italo. I am the pastor here, and we are very glad to be together here to worship God this morning. I have some announcements for you. They are also on your worship guide there. Tom and Sharon Coyle are moving. Everybody says, aww. But we will have a celebration, a celebratory farewell party on September 22nd, 5.30 to 7.30 at Josh and Mia Fields' house. You have the address there. So remember, Wednesday, instead of coming here, go to Josh and Mia's house. There will be nobody here. Church will be locked. And we'll be there at Josh and Mia's house. And you have a, a, form, a, a link there on your worship guide. You have a link there on the worship guide for you to sign up in our SVP. Please bring a side dish or dessert. And the fields will provide the entry. Now, the coils will not be in town September 26th and October 3rd. Their last Sunday at Covenant will be October 10th. So this might be your last chance to see them. So uh, come and be with us there. We have a sign-up sheet online because the fields need to know. They have to have an idea of how many people will be coming so that we can all be fed. So there is a sign-up sheet, onli sign sheet online, and there's a sign-up sheet in the back today. So if you already know that you're going, go and sign up that sign-up sheet. By that sign-up sheet, we have a map for you so that you know how to get there exactly, so that you will not be lost in Harlingen trying to find your way through the uh, windmills and so forth. So sign-up sheet in the back, map for you, sign-up sheet online, farewell party for the coils. Women's Bible Study is speaking back up on September 23rd at 10.30 a.m. via Zoom. If you need more information, contact Lisa Gutierrez, who is here today. So if you want information on that, Lisa is here today. Look for her, and she will get you some information on that. And if you need more information on the events and activities that happen here during the week, they are all in the back of your worship guide. So with that, let us listen to a short prelude. And uh, you have a verse there in the front of your worship guide to prepare our hearts to worship. Father, we are humbled to be in your presence. Lord, we thank you for your invitation that we should come and worship. That you've given us a day to set apart, to remember who sits on the throne, who rests on the throne so that we may rest. But Lord, we come from a work week that ended yesterday, and we do need to be reminded that we are those who are citizens of the kingdom of God, heirs of a new creation that has started in Jesus Christ. And then we pray, Lord, that prayer which 
him himself, he himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So if you please now stand as we are called to worship. We'll read it together there on your worship guide responsibly. The Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. Let's worship the King. All hail the power of Jesus' name. will be done corporately so you can read together uh, in the bulletin praise be to you God the Father you created all things by your power and wisdom and so loved the world that you gave your son to be our Savior praise be to you God the Son you became human like us in all things except sin died for our offenses and rose again for our justification Praise be to you, God, the Holy Spirit. You lead us into truth, 
and spread the love of God in our hearts. Our praise and glory be to you, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. We'll be confessing our faith from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, questions 37 and 38. Question 37 says the following, or asks the following, What benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? The souls of believers are at their death, made perfect in holiness, do immediately pass into glory, and their bodies, being still united to Christ, do rest in their graves till the resurrection. Question 38. What benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? At the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory shall be acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment and made perfectly blessed in the full enjoying of God to all eternity. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Amen Amen You may be seated. We'll continue with our confession of sin, and we'll read together. Most gracious and most merciful God, we confess to you and to one another that time after time we have entered your presence with countless prayers, but with hearts that have been closed to your grace. We have lifted our voices to you in praise, but we have used those same voices to speak ill of others. We have rehearsed your commandments, but have refused to see your call in the needs of our neighbor. We pray, Lord, that you forgive our lack of faith and pardon our acts of injustice. Grant us the healing that comes from your presence and the cleansing of your all-powerful word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And then we will continue with the silent confession, naming our sins one by one. And our assurance of pardon comes from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Please stand for our next hymn. Hymn 460, Amazing Grace. Was 
Now hear the word of God from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 66, verses 18 through 21. For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues. And they shall come and shall see my glory, and I will set sign among them. And from them I will send survivors to the nations, to Tarsh Tarshish, Pul, and Lud, who draw the bow, to Tubal and Yavan, to the coastlands far away that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the nations, and they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord on horses and in chariots, in litters and on mules and on dromedaries to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the Israelites bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of the Lord, and some of them also I will take for priests and for Levites says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. We continue now in praise and thanksgiving with our tithes and offerings. stand and sing the doxology. Everything we have, we receive from your hand, and we do it with grateful hearts. Continue to multiply for us your provision and also our gratitude that we may obey you, Lord, and participate as partners in the gospel and in the work of the church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious Father, you have made us of that rank of beings which is little lower than the heavenly beings and is crowned with glory and honor. For it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand, and the spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord. O God, you know our folly. The wrongs that we have done are not hidden from you. We were foolish in being disobedient, and our desires are senseless and harmful. We bless you that by a single offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, that he has finished transgression, put an end to sin, atoned for iniquity, and has brought in an everlasting righteousness. It is in Jesus' name that we present our prayers and petitions. Father, please bless those who are attending the marriage seminar and enable them to apply what they've learned to their lives. Protect the life and property of those displaced by the Hurricane Ida, who are now suffering from Hurricane Nicholas. Please protect and encourage and bless members of the persecuted Christian church. Please continue to bless and guide the training of men nominated for the office of elder and deacon. We thank you for allowing John and Kathy Cloud to be with us and explain the missionary work taking place in La Ceiba. Please continue to protect and bless their ministry. Please establish more reformed churches in the Rio Grande Valley and provide more Reformed pastors to preach your word. Please keep blessing and expanding Pastor Gama's church plant in Edinburgh. Father, please extend your mercy and blessings on those who are hurting. We pray this morning for uh, Helen and Jim's daughter, Cheryl, who's having brain surgery on October 4th. We ask that you have mercy on her and guide the doctors who are treating her. Please comfort Paul Tamlin's family for the passing away of his sister, Teresa, and, and niece, Amy. Please continue healing Janie from her surgery. Please heal Elena's sister, Alicia, who is, has cancer. Please bless Florence, Nancy, and Judy with the comfort of your presence. Please soften the hearts of those in our families who have not accepted Jesus as, a, as their Savior. Father, please open our ears, quiet our minds, and soften our hearts so that we may hear and accept the truth revealed in Scripture. Through your Spirit, empower Pastor Idolo to exposit on your word with power and clarity. Lord, you have told us that godliness holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come, and that if we seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, other things will be added to us, and therefore we cast all our anxieties about these things on you, who cares for us. For our Heavenly Father knows that we need them all. Please rescue us from every evil deed and bring us safely into our king heavenly kingdom, your heavenly kingdom, being kept from stumbling. May we be presented blameless at the coming of your glory with great joy. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Then please open your Bibles in the letter of Peter. First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. You know, the mission of the church, the mission of the church is to propagate the gospel throughout the world. That, that is the task of the church. And the question that we have been focusing on is this. How can ordinary people like you participate in spreading the good news about the kingdom of Jesus all over the world? Well, there is another question that many of us might have asked, which is this, when and how are Christians expected to tell others about Jesus? Well, if you're interested in knowing the answer, well, this passage is for you. So let's read verses 13 to 17 of 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, 
those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. The flower withers, well, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. So we, we have been in a series propagating the gospel throughout the world. And I, I need to disclose to you that the series was inspired by a book. The author is John Dixon, and the name of the book is The Best Kept Secret of Christian Mission, and I owe him a great debt of gratitude for his work in that. And today is the last sermon in this series, the last sermon. And the mission of the church is to propagate the gospel throughout the world. And just to remind you, it's printed there on your worship guide. I've been saying this every week. The gospel is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And the church has been given this job to spread the news about Jesus throughout the world and to make disciples of all nations. And for this task to take place, we have learned in the previous weeks, that there is a lot more, there, there are a lot more activities other than preaching that spread the gospel through the world. Preaching is essential, but it is not the only means to do the work. And in review, if you like to take notes, we have some blanks for you there on your worship guide. And here is your first blank. Reviewing what we've done so far. How can ordinary people like you participate in propagating the gospel throughout the world? Well, first, we're going to need the mindset of Jesus in our social lives. Number two is prayer. Number three was partnership in the gospel. And we talked about a specifically financial partnership with those who are laboring and preaching the gospel. We talked about how your sanctification and your good works beautify the world, beautify the gospel. And that's what the world needs most from us. It's our sanctification. Last week, we talked about how all of us together in the public worship right here today, we've already started doing that with our voices, declaring the gospel to the world. And today, we will talk about the call of God upon us all, that we must, here's your next blank, be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks. Be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks. You know, Peter, the apostle, is calling all of us to be prepared to respond to anyone who asks for the reason for the hope that is in us. Without words, without words, the gospel is not going to spread. Someone must be told with words in your voices about Jesus. The Barna Group, some of you guys know the Barna Group. It's a research group that does research on religious trends. In 1993, they've They've said that 9 out of 10 Christians who had shared their faith agreed with this statement. So in 1993, 9 out of 10 Christians would agree with this statement. Every Christian has a responsibility to share their faith. Today, the number is four times smaller, which is 6 in 10. Six in ten agree today that it is the responsibility of every Christian to tell others about their faith. The Barna group also tried to figure it out, like why? Why people why aren't people having these spiritual conversations? Well, the first reason 
given by people is that religious conversations always seem to create tension or arguments. Next comes, I'm put off by how religion has been politicized. Next comes, I'm not religious and don't care about these kinds of topics. Next we have, I don't feel like I know enough to talk about religious or spiritual topics. And then we have several other reasons. I don't know, uh, I, I don't want to be known as a religious person. Others said, I don't know how to talk about religion or spiritual topics without sign, sounding weird. It's a weird conversation. I'm afraid that people will see me as fanatic or extremist. And last but not least, I've been hurt. I've been hurt by religious conversations in the past. So we all need to think this morning about the question, when and how does the Lord expect me to speak to others about him? That's the question for this morning. And Peter has given us the answer there, which is, you need to always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks. Now, to be prepared to give an answer, let's look at some things here. The first one, it's your next blank. Let's get some clarity on the job. What is the job? What is the job? You know, in this passage, Peter's calling everyone in the church to be prepared to make a defense. On verse 15 we read, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now the word there that we translate defense in the Greek is the word apologia, which is the word from where apologetics comes from. Some of you guys know that word, apologetics. But Peter is not calling the church to be prepared for a formal debate with 40 minutes opening arguments and then a, a, a grueling cross-examination afterward. What Peter is calling uh, uh, the church to do is that we should be prepared to give an answer. In the context of that answer, as you read there in the text, is to anyone who asks. Be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks. Who is anyone who asks? What is this? Well, that's the context of your everyday life. In conversational life, with people in your life, when someone asks, you are prepared to have those conversations and to give an answer for the hope that is in you, to have a conversation about your faith. You're prepared to do that. And we have a parallel passage to this by the Apostle Paul. It is almost as if Peter and Paul knew each other and taught the same things. Because in Colossians chapter 4, look what we read that Paul wrote. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech, well, your conversation, always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you might know how you ought to answer. So that you know how you ought to answer each person. What Paul is saying is quite similar to what Peter is saying here, that we are to be prepared to give an answer. And an answer will happen when someone asks. Or perhaps someone makes a comment in your everyday life. Anyone who asks. And we are to be prepared to have conversations about Christianity, about our faith, about the hope that we have. 
And here is your next blank then. Not all of us will speak to others about the gospel in the same way. Which is to say, not all of us are called to do what Paul and Peter did. Not all of us are called to be evangelists. Some of us do have gifts and offices which require us to speak in ways and contexts as a matter of our vocation and calling, our jobs. But, and your blank is coming up, but all of us are called to answer for the gospel and must be willing. All of us are called to answer for the gospel and must be willing to do so when we have opportunities. So it is not enough for us to know the truth. It is not enough for us to know the truth. We must be willing to have these conversations and to give reasoned answers for the hope that we have. You must be willing to confess before those who have questions and comments concerning your faith. I just want to give you an example of that. It's an everyday life. While I was in Vicksburg through seminary, I was at Chick-fil-A on a Saturday morning studying the Bible because studying the Bible at Chick-fil-A works better. If you guys haven't known that, you should try it out. I was just there studying the Bible when a arena, an arena football team walks in at Chick-fil-A and fills that place. Immediately, one of those players walks up to me and says, point blank, are you a pastor? I didn't have a name tag or anything. I, I wasn't dressed. I was wearing shorts and flip-flops. But he asked me if I was a pastor. Well, I said no. But... I am training to be one. And then we started to have a conversation. And then he said something like, you know, before the games, before I play the games, I read the Bible so that I can get, like, amped up and tuned for the game. So we start talking about that. And because I'm a fellow athlete, I used to play soccer, and I'm seeing this arena football team drive up, on a Saturday morning, on bus, on a bus, vans and cars, they were kind of carpooling. I know what that is. That's people who like the sport, who love the sport, who are trying to make it to the next level. So I knew that. So I started to talk to him about that. I'm just having a conversation about my favorite subjects. So I told him, look, when I used to play soccer, I thought that if I could make it big in soccer and hear the roar of the crowd for me, that my cup would be filled. But I was wrong, I told him. Jesus is the only one who can fill my cup. And then I had the Bible right there, right? So I opened in John and read some verses. And then Eric was his name. Eric said, well, I think God is trying to tell me something. And then I said, I'm 100% positive he's trying to tell you something. And then he told me a little more about his life, which was very turmoil, very difficult life, and how he was in pain being on the road, even though he wanted to play football. And then I asked if I could pray with him. We prayed, and then he got on the bus and left. That's it. I did not tell Eric everything I had to tell him. I did not worry about some outline that I had to follow and exhaustively present to him. I was at Chick-fil-A, and I just had a conversation. I did not come to Eric and said, hey, I'm a pastor. You want to talk about the Bible? No, he came to me, and he asked me a question. And we are prepared to give this type of answer in an everyday conversational way. We do that. 
Now, Peter also tells us, here's your next blank, that there is a way to do the job. There is a way to do the job. You know, Peter says in verse 13 that we are to be zealous for what is good, that we are to pursue. That's what being zealous means. We are in a pursuit of something. We're zealous for that. We are pursuing what is good. In verse 14, we are also told to be pursuing righteousness. And both of these do remind us of that sermon that we talked about, right? Which is our manner of living must adorn, must beautify our conversations. So we are to do it in a way that makes the gospel appealing. In verse 16, Peter tells us that we are to give an answer with gentleness. Gentleness. Now, to be gentle is knowing when to restrain great strength. To be gentle is not to be weak or soft, but it's to know, to be wise, to moderate power for the sake of someone else. That's what gentleness is. Peter also tells us to do it with respect. And what is respect? Respect is assigning someone the dignity that they deserve. Respect is to assign to someone the dignity that they deserve. And how do you do this in these conversations? You are to treat everyone with the dignity that they deserve. What is the dignity that every human being deserves? Every human being was created in God's image. They're all image bearers. So we are to talk to people with respect. They are not stupid. They are not unintelligent. They are not beyond hope. They're not animals. They are human beings bearing God's image. However imperfect it may be at that time. Respect. And we are to do it also with a good conscience. With a good conscience. How can someone keep or have a good conscience? Friends, the only way to do that, to have a good conscience, is to believe the gospel and to live, to live, to live your everyday life, the teaching of the gospel. And what that often means is that we understand that we are sinful. We are sinful, and we know where to take our sinfulness to so that we can have a good conscience. But in a conversation like that, it also means to do it in a way that is without sin. When you're having one of those conversations, you want to do it sinlessly. Sinlessly. You want to have a good conscience. Boy, do I have a story to tell you about how I found out how, how difficult that is. So I want to tell you that story. I had a coworker that I used to talk to about the Bible and the gospel. We would be working. We didn't want to drive in traffic in Houston, so we usually stayed late. And uh, we would have these conversations because he was a, a proselyte Jew. So he was not a Jew by birth, but he had converted to Judaism. And I was very interested in knowing how, how is it that you don't see that Jesus is the Messiah? And then we would have these conversations. But in these conversations, he would bring in all kinds of arguments from other religions, not just Judaism. And sometimes he would make these outlandish statements, just like, you know, I don't want to repeat them here because the one needs to, because the story is more about me. But outlandish, are, like, arguments. And then, one of those times, I just lost it. I just, I just felt so angry at this man. So angry. And I, 
you know, we were alone in the office. I started screaming. And immediately my conscience kicked in gear. And I realized, I, I, I just don't know what this is anymore, but this is not having a conversation about the hope that I have. And I, you know, I, I ended my diatribe against him, and I immediately felt guilty and miserable. I did have the opportunity shortly thereafter to confess to him and ask him to forgive me, but I knew that that door was closed, and I could even see it in my head, even though it might not be true, but I could see it in my head, this man one day saying, yeah, those Christians, man, they're crazy. I've known a Christian that just started yelling at me. So it is harder to do than we dare to confess. What, I, what we need to learn is that it's much more important to win the person. Win the person. Lose the argument. Lose the argument, but win the person. It is much better to have gentleness, respect, goodness, a clear conscience than a smart and articulate argument. So to do this job then, we also need, here's your next blank, we need to bring all activities together with intentionality. We need to bring all activities together with intentionality. You know, where you, your willingness to give an answer will be demonstrated by how you bring all these things that we've been talking about. Prayer, public worship, your social life, having these conversations, your partnership in the gospel. How do you bring all of these things together into your life with intentionality, with intention? What kind of intention? You are searching for someone, anyone, to ask you. Intentionality is, I am ready. I am prepared to have these conversations. <laughs> Who is going to ask me? Someone is going to ask me. That's what this means. And how do you do that? I want to give you a bunch of practical things if you want to write them down. You know, here's one thing that you can do. Invite people for a meal at your house. Invite people for a meal at your house. Second thing you can do is invite people to worship at church. Invite people to worship at church. Did you know that statistically only two out of a hundred of us, two out of a hundred of us Christians and churchgoers invite an unchurched person to go to church? Only two. And then you would think, wow, we are a bunch of cynical, pessimistic people. And if you thought that, you'd be correct because the statistic shows, the statistic shows that half of the unchurched people would go to church if a family member, a neighbor, or a friend invited them to go to church. That is unbelievable. That's amazing. 2% invite someone to go to church. Half of the unchurched people would go to church if invited. <laughs> invite someone to church. Don't think that everyone is like never going to go to church. Because that's the image you have in your head. Would you go to church with me? And they would say, get the behind of me. Get out of here. No, no church. That's what we expect, not knowing that you flip a coin and that person might say yes. Third, seek to know your children's friends and your grandchildren's friends. You have children or grandchildren? Well, who are their friends? Find out who their friends are. How about writing an email or a letter to someone? 
write an email or a letter to someone. Stay in touch with somebody. Pay attention to people in your life, in your everyday interactions. If you go to the restaurant, who's the waiter? Give that waiter or waitress the dignity that they deserve as a person who carries along with them the image of God. Go to the doctor. Who are the doctors and the nurses? Pay attention to other people in your life. Give someone a Bible. Give someone a Bible. That's, that's particularly meaningful to me. Can you guys see this? This is a New Testament. Seen this before? This is a Gideon New Testament. Okay? Very tiny, very little. And my father, when he moved from home to go to work at a different city, his boss said, hey, do you have a Bible? And my father said, well, no, because, you know, I'm from the Roman Catholic Church. We have a very big Bible, the family Bible, and we don't really read the Bible, you know. And then this Gideon, his boss was a Gideon. He said, I got a Bible for, for you. Here's a Bible. Here's a New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs. For six years, my father did not even open that. But then on the seventh year, guilty, depressed, unable to sleep at night, knowing all his sins, he opened it. He opened it and started to read and then decided that he needed to go to church. So he went to his boss and said, I want to go to church. So his boss took him to church. And guess who was going with my father to church? Little two-year-old Italo. That's how I got to church. You could say that I'm here in front of you right now because someone gave this little book to someone else. That's it. Give someone a Bible. So, willingness to give an answer in a manner that makes the gospel attractive with intentionality in all these activities. Be prepared to give an answer. But for you to be prepared to give an answer, perhaps the next one is the most important one that we need to, to be clear on. Here's your next blank. Who are we serving? Who are we serving? You know, in verses 14 and 15, we read, Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. What Peter is saying there, literally, in the Greek, is this. The fear of them do not fear. The fear of them do not fear, nor be in dread. Translating it as do not fear them is a very good translation. It's an accurate translation. Do not fear them or the fear that they cause. But literally, what Peter is saying is this. Do not fear what they fear. Do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. Do not fear who fears. Well, the people who are not serving Christ as Lord. Do not fear what they fear. Instead of fear and dread, what are we to do? Peter says it. In your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord, as holy. What does it mean to honor Christ, the Lord, as holy? It means that in your hearts, there must be only one, only one. That one, he is holy. He is set apart from all others. He is on a class of his own. He is holy. He is sanctified. Another way to say this is in your hearts, hallow Christ as Lord or the Lord. Peter is teaching that when we 
fear someone else or something else. Listen, when we fear someone else or something else, we are putting that fear, which is the fear they have, in the same class as Jesus. That means that Jesus is no longer holy. He is common. You know, I fear this, I fear that, I fear this, and I fear Jesus. He has become common, not holy. But in your heart, you must have Jesus as holy. You must have Jesus as holy. The Lord. He is the Lord. The only Lord. Do not fear what they fear. If you fear what they fear, you will not be prepared to give an answer. Ever. What do they fear? Well, the world fears public opinion. At the time Peter wrote it, the church feared public opinion. That was the temptation. The Romans didn't like the church. That there was another Lord other than Caesar. No. We want a common Lord. If you have another Lord, he is a Lord like Caesar. Not holy. So they fear the public opinion. There was a Lord for the, for the Romans and it is a Lord for the people today. Public opinion. I don't want people to see me as a bigot. I don't want to be labeled as unreasonable or a fanatic. I don't want to be labeled as a fundamentalist. I don't want to be, even if the accusation is false or slanderous, I don't, I don't even want to be accused. We fear the public opinion. They fear the public opinion. The world fears the public opinion so much that they, they virtue signaling. They, they do virtual signals to people. Look, let me, do, let me show you my virtue in this place so that you won't even think that I believe something else. Don't fear what they fear, because if you do, you're not going to be prepared. What else does the world fear? Financial insecurity. The fear serves financial security as a Lord. It is holy to them. Financial security. If I'm always prepared to tell others about Jesus, I might lose my job. I'm not telling you to go out and lose your job, nor is Peter. But if you are always prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that you have, you might eventually have to make that decision. It is true. But the world fears the loss of their jobs. They do. It is like a Lord to them. It's the one who provides for them. It's their career. And Peter's saying, don't fear what they fear. The world definitely fears death. Death is like a lord to the world. Death. They fear death. They want to make amends with death and make death seem natural. The world wants to make it a part of life so that they won't be afraid of it. But it is a Lord. I found a, a headline recently in the news that says this. The ultimate disruption? What Jeff Bezo Bezos and fellow billionaires are doing to beat death. And the article was about how billionaires are spending hundreds of millions of dollars to do scientific and genetic research to reverse aging because they don't want to die. They fear death. They want to defeat death. And Peter is saying, do not fear what they fear. If you fear what the world fears, you will not be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. Jesus must be the only Lord. The only Lord. No other Lords. Only this one Lord in your heart.
printed there in your worship guide. You have Matthew chapter 10, verse 27 to 33. Let's read there. Let me read it for you. Follow as I read. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. In what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And that is the Lord. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. If you have feared what the world fears, if you have feared what the world fears, and that's why you haven't been prepared to give an answer for your faith, we need to repent. You need to repent. You need to believe the gospel. And you need to say, Lord, please forgive me. I have feared other lords. And then you will know the sweetness of the gospel. And that will take you one step closer into being prepared to give an answer. But you need to sanctify the Lord as Lord. So to be prepared to give an answer, you need that. But here's what else you need. The next one, your next blank. You also need to be clear on why we do it. You need to be clear on why we do it. In the passage that we read from Peter, there is a verse there that has this, this conjunction, right? So that, so that. That's the purpose. That's the why we do it. And it's verse 16. Read there on verse 16 with me. So that when you are slandered, those who revile you, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So that those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So in scripture, in scripture, often shame and hope are juxtaposed. Shame and hope are put together in the same passage. Shame and hope in the same passage, often in the Bible. So that you can compare those two, shame and hope. Shame and hope. Hope, then, in the Bible... Hope that is fulfilled, you know, when you hope in something and that hope comes to pass, what you experience is joy. And a hope that is frustrated brings shame. So in scripture, the closest opposite that you have to joy is not sorrow. In scripture, the opposite of joy is not sorrow, it's shame. And that's what we see here at work in this passage as well. And why is that important to you? Because here's your next blank. Your hope, your hope is so big and so absolutely certain that it demonstrates the futility of everyone else's hope. Because your hope has been coming to pass and it will come to pass. So you have joy. And your hope demonstrates to the world the futility of their hope, which only brings shame. So what is your hope? Let's talk about that. Here's your next blank. What is your hope? The hope that Jesus is going to build his church. Look at me. This is very important. If you believe that the gospel will not advance, if you believe that right now the church is contracting, the church is diminishing in size, if you believe that there is only less and less people believing and only less and less people are going to believe, 
It's unlikely you are going to be as prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have than if you believe what the Bible teaches, which is the gospel is unstoppable. The church is unstoppable. Unstoppable. The church is never contracting in the world. It is only growing. If you think that the Great Commission will be frustrated, you are reading the news, not the Bible. Because the Bible says that Jesus has been given all authority, and the Great Commission is to teach all nations to obey all that he has commanded. And then you read the book of Acts. Do you think the book of Acts demonstrates that the gospel will not advance? Is that, what the, is that what the book of Acts shows us? That the church is contracting. The church is being sieged. That is not what the Bible teaches. The gates of hell have been broken and carried away. Jesus will build his church. If you believe that, you will have more of these conversations. You will plant more seeds. You will cast more nets. Because now you have the expectation that I will catch some fish. Some fish. My seeds will eventually grow. That's the hope. Second, here's your next blank. The second is our hope of the second coming of Jesus. The hope of the second coming of Jesus. Our ultimate hope. Our ultimate hope is in the second coming of Jesus. That's when we will be resurrected from the dead. That's what's going to happen. Jesus will come back. We will be risen from the dead. And it is because of that day that we do what we do. What if, what if that's not the case? What if Jesus does not come back? Then we have some serious problems with what we believe. If Jesus does not come back, we would never have a world that stops groaning because of sin. We would never see what a perfect world looks like. Never. We would never experience perfection. We would never know what it is like to defeat death. Death would be a constant enemy forever. But Jesus will come back. But if Jesus didn't come back, our trust in Jesus would never be vindicated. Never. We would never have an actual victorious procession of the king who has conquered. But Jesus will come back, and we all be vindicated on our hope. It is going to happen. That is our hope. We will have vindication at the day of Jesus Christ. But most importantly, I think, if Jesus never came back, ever, we would have to continue to propagate the gospel forever. We would have to, to be prepared and work at this forever. The gospel would never reach its end. History would never resolve, and Jesus would never deliver the kingdom to his Father. Which means for us this, we would never have real rest. We would never have real rest. If Jesus doesn't come back, we don't have a hope for eternal rest. But beloved, that is our hope. That we can be prepared now to have these conversations. Because we will rest. We will have rest. Our hope is rest. That's why we do this. That's why we do this. So, 
How can ordinary people like you participate? Be prepared to give an answer. It is a great privilege to do this. It is the cherry on top to be able to have these conversations and to give someone the reason for these hopes that we just talked about. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great encouragement, for your great encouragement in having these conversations with people. Lord, we confess that we have not always been prepared to give an answer. Lord, we have not always brought these activities together with intentionality. Lord, we have not always been gentle and, and respectful and zealous for what's good in our work of having these conversations. Lord, we have not always had Jesus as the Lord in our hearts so that we feared what they fear and we have not had these conversations. And Lord, we have lost sight of our hope for so, so many times. What is our hope? Lord, by your Spirit's power, will you please forgive us, remind us, and empower us in your Spirit to be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks. Let our lives be a defense for the gospel so that we will experience the joy, the joy of the hope that we have and even see others come to faith in Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. If you then please stand And we will sing, which I think is, is probably top five favorite hymns for me. We love to tell the story. The title is incorrect there on your worship guide, but the words are correct. I love to tell the story.
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Go in peace. Amen. 